good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I would like to welcome you all to this fifth WASAC webinar series entitled Collaboration on Promoting Quinoa, Part 1. My name is Remy Nono Wondim. I'm the Deputy Director of the Plant Production and Protection Division of FAO in Rome and the moderator of this webinar. Please note that you are muted and you may use the chat function if you have comments. Please use the Q&A function by clicking on the icon. Label Q&A at the bottom of the screen. All questions will be collected, compiled for the Q&A session. The webinar is being recorded and the link will be circulated after this event. For more information, you can contact the support team of WASAC at water-scarcity at sao.org. The purpose of this webinar is threefold. One, discuss the characterization and sharing of quinoa's biodiversity. Two, showcase the improvements in germ plasm suitable for saline and dry marginal environments. And three, reveal the emerging opportunities in quinoa production. For the opening remarks, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Isman Elwasi, the Director General of the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture since 2012. Prior to joining IGBA, Dr. Elwafi had held management positions with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. She also worked as a scientist with several international research organizations, including the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas, ICADA, Japan International Research Center for Agricultural Science, and the International Maize and Wheat Center Improvement Center. Dr. Elwafi holds a PhD in genetics. Dr. Elwafi, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Remy, for the introduction. And thank you to FAO and WASAG, particularly for organizing this session on quinoa. So in my opening remark, um, I'm going to just give some few ideas from my perspective on quinoa as a crop, as an example of a use of agrobiodiversity. So as we saw today, our world is a really different place. Unfortunately, everything we took for granted just about six months ago has been really turned upside down. We are all now trying to adapt to a new normal. The way we work and live has changed quite a lot. So virtual meetings like today uh, are becoming really the new norm for us and for many people. And it was all due to one little virus in the grand scheme of things, coronavirus, COVID-19, which has really caused a global pandemic and affected nearly all sectors of economy and segments of society. So it started out as a health emergency, but the current crisis has also led bare the shortcoming of and weaknesses in many of our systems, and specifically food systems. So we have once again realized how risky even temporary disruption in global food supply change could be, especially for countries that are reliant on food import, which is by the end the majority of the countries in the South. But even local food supply chains are not safe from the ramification of the pandemic. There is a growing concern that millions of people worldwide might fall below the poverty line and join the ranks of some 821 million undernourished already. So the ramification, it's not only the pandemic per se, it's, it's, not, it's mostly the reaction of government and people as well to the pandemic that got us into a bigger hole than we expected six months ago or four months ago. The case to shock, shock proof our food system has never been more evident. We have to rethink what kind of food we produce 
and how we produce it. Our food system are currently unhealthily dependent on few major crops. Just 15 crops provide 90% of our food energy intake, of which two thirds comes from only wheat, maize, and rice. And the recent months have shown how vulnerable low-income net importer of staple food are to global supply chain disruption and price hikes. And one example that I want to give, it's many countries in the Sahel are trying to produce rice because the rice is a staple crop in their communities. Although they know, and all the scientists in their countries and abroad have told them that it's not the best crop for your environment. But because of the pressure, and because of the way the market is used, and because we are getting so much used to those staple crops, the whole thing has been a little bit skewed. So we must draw the right lessons from the current crisis and prioritize crop diversification more than ever before, specifically in marginal environment like the Sahel or areas that have higher water scarcity. There is a huge and untapped potential in terms of agrodiversity, as there are around 30,000 known edible plant species in the world, we must enrich our food system and diets with these underutilized and neglected crops. And quinoa for me and for many is a really success story. It's a great example of how collective and coordinated global efforts can bring about major changes across the food value chain and systems. In less than a decade, quinoa has become a darling of agribusinesses and farmers in over 100 countries. And a lot of credit goes to FAO for really leading that effort and bringing everybody around the table. And for me, quinoa, it's a really a symbol of agrobiodiversity as well. I have this book that I really cherish, which is, it's a book that was made by University National University of Agraria de la Molina from Peru by, by my dear friend, Luz uh, Gomez and by Ana Luz Maria. And what it shows, it shows all the agrobiodiversity in, in, in quinoa. And for me, the color says it. So it's a, it's a crop that the grain and the seeds color goes from basically white to black with all the colors in between. We at ICBA have also run a global program on quinoa since 2007. Our scientists have worked with our plant partners, including FAO, to identify, test, and introduce quinoa in different regions. To date, we have identified and developed five high-yielding salt and drought-tolerant quinoa genotypes and released them as varieties in Middle East, in North Africa, and Central Asia. We have several success stories in different countries, including Egypt, Morocco, and Kyrgyzstan. And these success stories prove that change is possible. So we have always thought that we can't really add much to the, to the basic crops in many countries, but really quinoa story across the world shows that it's possible when it's the right crop. So we really need to turn the current crisis into an opportunity to enhance our food system and make them more resilient, not only to climate change, which is a huge risk that we have been debating for the last two, two decades, but also to any other unforeseen shocks and risk, like the COVID-19. As quinoa is still viewed largely as a niche crop and an upmarket food, the main question is, what should we do to make it a staple crop among smallholder farmers and rural communities? What should we do to make it affordable to the poorest people that will benefit from having access to quinoa in their diet? And I'm sure that this webinar, both part one and part two, that is coming in a few weeks, will answer or help us to answer some of these questions and give us a renewed impetus to effort to popularize quinoa in marginal environments and beyond. With that, I thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to hear Didier and RK and their presentation. Thank you, Remy. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elwafi. Some take-home message, rethink what kind of food we produce, 
prioritize crop diversification, especially in marginal areas, and make our food systems more resilient, not only to climate change, but to other uh, threats. Thank you again. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Didier Basil. Dr. Didier Basil is uh, Senior Biodiversity Advisor at the French Agriculture Research Center for International Development, FIRAD in Montpellier, France. He is an active researcher in agroecology with a focus on agrobiodiversity and plant genetic resources. Didier holds a PhD in rural geography and he graduated as director of research in Montpellier. After different international experiences in Africa, Asia, and South America, he joined CIRAD in 2001 as principal scientist, where he develops an ecosystem approach for in situ conservation of biodiversity and promotes participatory research. For the International Year of Quinoa in 2013, Didier coordinated the book called The State of the Art Report on Quinoa Around the World in 2013, published by FAO and CIRAT. During 2014-2016, he was invited at FAO headquarters to serve as visiting expert on Quinoa International Focal Point. Didier, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Remy, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I will first share my screen and I will begin my presentation just after. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Buenos dias in America del Sur. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Al-Salam Malikum for North Africa and Middle East. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. And first of all, I want to thank the organization for giving me this opportunity to meet you through this webinar on collaboration on promoting quinoa. At CIRAD, all our researches are built in partnership with national and local stakeholders in developing countries. So collaboration is central for us. My speech is focused on the importance of quinoa genetic diversity, both for sustainable use in Indian countries and for quinoa crop adaptation outside the Andes. Research partnerships have often facilitated the exchanges of germplasts and have had a powerful impact on quinoa development by strengthening collaborations. Quinoa was first domesticated in Andean countries over 7,000 years ago. Following the Spanish conquest, quinoa was rejected as an Indian food. The centuries of neglect, the potential of quinoa was rediscovered during the second half of the 20th century. Since then, the number of countries importing quinoa increased, with new producers appearing on the map and quinoa now being cultivated in many areas outside the Andes. The geographical increase in distribution of quinoa has highlighted the difficulty of access to quality seed, which is a key factor for testing the crop outside the Andes and for adapting the species to new environments. In this context, research partnerships have helped promote the exchange of quinoa germplasts have allowed trials to be undertaken in non-traditional areas of cultivation. But what is really quinoa? Quinoa crop is a member of the Amatronaceae family and closely related to beets, spinach, and common lob squatters. Quinoa is cultivated for its edible grains, but the plant has broad uses, like the consumption of young leaves, and it also serves as animal fodder. Quinoa was domesticated near Lake Titicaca between Peru and Bolivia. And during centuries, generations of farmers have been involved in quinoa selections, which explains the high level of genetic diversity found today. Quinoa diversity at continental scale in South America 
has been associated with five main ecotypes, islands, interandean valleys, salares, yungas, and coastal lowlands. Each of these ecotypes is associated with sub-center of diversity that comes from the surrounding of the lake Titicaca. And each one corresponds to specific conditions of altitude, latitude, and is adapted to specific soils and climatic conditions. Thanks to this high level of genetic diversity, quinoa crop is highly resilient to agroecological extremes, soils, rainfall, temperatures, and altitude and the quinoa crop is tolerant to frost, drought, and salinity. The question is what can be grown in new environments outside the Andes? The differences are very pronounced between ecotypes. The sea level ecotype is very different from the other. Quinoa from the central and southern part of Chile representing the lowland ecotype at sea level is the more adapted for experimenting quinoa outside the Edson, and especially, especially to temperate or Mediterranean environments. The spread of worldwide quinoa is made from strong relationship between institutions that share their genetic material. And then countries hold the larger germplasm collection with more than 6,000 accession conserved by Peru and Bolivia genbanks. But many countries have established collection prior to the signature of the Convention of Biological Diversity, which specifies that these states are to the sum right over these genetic resources. And you can see red triangles on the map representing 25 countries worldwide that can share their kilo accession without any obligation of referring to other countries in accordance to global regulation on biodiversity in since 1992. These countries are the new suppliers of our quinoa seeds today. Until the 80s, quinoa was only cultivated in six Andean countries in green on the map. During the past 30 years, quinoa was tested in all the continents. Nowadays, quinoa is cultivated in more than 125 countries. Quinoa globalization entails challenges to the country's origin and these are important to consider for future Understanding this reality is fundamental to face the challenges of conserving local biodiversity, developing and promoting new varieties, and cooperating on plant genetic resources exchanges with inclusive processes toward fair benefits with Indian countries. How can we consider quinoa's biodiversity for sustainable agriculture development, considering more the food security and nutrition? Firstly, quinoa is a good example of adaptive crop for many environments that can help to restore agricultural systems in marginal and degraded areas. Second, as quinoa is rustic, agroecological practices help improve resource efficiency of production with low external inputs and few water consumption. Third, quinoa could serve a nutrition-sensitive agriculture, and it is considered among the 20 world healthiest foods thanks to its overall nutrient richness with added health benefits. Fourth, quinoa remains cultivated by small-scale farmers worldwide with a global average of one or two hectares per producer. Fifth, Without NM farmers, we will not have quinoa high genetic diversity today. And it is a permanent effort for maintaining in a dy dynamic way this biocultural heritage. Quinoa development worldwide must not forget Indian development. And it is very important to connect the Andes to the world and the world to the Andes. There are some key messages for concluding. Access to quinoa germplasm and benefit sharing from its utilization should be addressed. Recognizing the hard work of the Andean people in the selection and conservation of local quinoa land races, maintaining and adding value to quinoa's biodiversity through diversification for the benefit of global food security poverty reduction. Quinoa is more than only a crop, its biodiversity is at the heart of an innovative agri-food system. 
that can really inspire for its spreading. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Didier. Thank you for this excellent presentation on global spreading of quinoa, a single domesticated species with five ecotypes. And also thank you for your views regarding access to quinoa germplasm and benefit sharing, and also about uh, the role that quinoa could play in innovative agri-food systems. Our next speaker is Dr. Rakesh Kumar Singh, Program Leader, Crop Diversification and Genetic Session, and Principal Scientist at the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture. Uh, before joining IGBA, Dr. Rakesh worked as lead rice breeder for salinity and problem soils at International Rice Research Institute here in the Philippines. He has served as regional plant breeding coordinator for Eastern and Southern Africa in Tanzania, rain-fed lowland rice breeder for Southeast Asia in the Philippines, and principal scientist in India Council of Agricultural Research in India. He has vast experience of more than three decades on breeding for abiotic stress, tolerance in plants, and instrumental to develop more than 25 improved crop varieties. Rakesh, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you very much, Remy, for this nice introduction. And let me, let me share my screen first. So I hope you can have the screen over there. So once again, thanks to FAO and WASAC to give me this opportunity to share my presentation with you. And thanks to Remy for that. So first of all, when we are talking about the quinoa, it's a nutrient dense crop. And in one separate session, we will just talk about the, its nutrient uh, quality of that. So the topic of my presentation is on germplasm improvement for saline and dry marginal environments. When we say germplasm improvement for the dry marginal environments, we are talking about the marginal environment which are for biophysical in the nature, not any other type because marginal environment can be defined in a different terms. And specifically, we are just dealing with the saline and dry marginal environment. So first of all, what kind of germplasm you could have? for the such type of harsh environments. So first of all, we have to see which are the crops which are suitable for such type of environment. And quinoa is like particularly, you know, the outrightly winner in this one. If you can see that salinity, because four is the like a starting point of the salinity, you know, US and book 60 say that. And you can see the quinoa can grow very well up to the 20 decimal per, per meter. While if you talk about the salinity, the barley is the most tolerant food crop in our food system. And barley, the threshold salinity is 8 decimal, while quinoa threshold salinity is more, uh, more than around 12 decimal per meter. And you can see that it is threshold salinity, but it can grow very well under the 20, until the 20 decimal, which is around 40 deci, 40% 40 of the seawater salinity. You can see in this right hand pictures the pearl millet sorghum, the barley, the maize, and amaranthus, they can grow only in the few levels, while quinoa can grow up to the 20 decimal. In the next slide, it will come up. The second part was a dry environment or arid environment. Quinoa and pearl millet are the two candidates which are good for the dry environment or arid environment, while barley and wheat are not so tolerant for that. And there are certain varieties, but you can say that quinoa can grow on the amount of the water needed half of the what barley and wheat needs. About the intra-crop, when we see that quinoa is the best crop for that, what about the within the crop variability? And you can see that within the crop, sorry, within the crop variability, you can see that some of the variety, this is a 0, 4, 8, 12, 16, and 20 decimal and 24 decimal. You can see the varieties are coming up to the flowering stage. This is the early stage and this is the later stage. And these varieties can grow very well until 20 decimal. It's not only for the salinity tolerance, but also for the morphological basis. You can find for the maturity, color, height, and saponinic content, there are different traits. And we have the enough diversity within the quinoa, and equa has hands on those type of diversity. 
once you are developing a variety, what kind of variety you are developing? So there are certain institutes for working on the breeding. Ikwa is one, as Dr. Swan mentioned. Ikwa is one which is working on Inua introduction, breeding, and agronomy since 2007. Since a long, there are other institutions, but they are mostly working on introduction, domestication, or genomics. Not many on the breeding, and even if they are on the breeding, they are very recently working on the Inua. So, based on that, you know, large experience of the Ikwa, we have developed five different Inua variety, Ikwa Q1, Ikwa Q2, Ikwa Q3, Ikwa Q4, and Ikwa Q5. And they are diverse for their maturity duration. Some are very, very early maturing, and some are a little bit late maturing. Also for the plant height, stem diameter, and also the yield, very high yielding, and some are okay. But the one thing which is not good, that all are having the saponin content. So we need to have a variety which could be a saponin free. So what happened that this is the first first work on the quinoa, but later on we are just thinking about that. What is the need of the market segmentation, or that's called product profiling. So based on the product profiling, we are looking. This is an example for MENA region. If we have to have the product profiling for the MENA region, we need to know that what kind of environment is there and why, where is the window, which is the window for quinoa production. If the Quinoa production window is only the, from the mid up toward the mid up. Well, we have to look for the early maturing variety. So this variety product profile, like uh, have the must traits, range traits, and the win or game changer. So based on this one, we just provide our breeders, meet like us also, that what is the variety needed in this region and why and how should we go for the breeding a variety for this region. So high yield definitely big says size of the grain drought tolerance is there but heat tolerance is also needed so this is one of the must traits on that one can increase the salinity threshold salinity from 12 to 15 decimal one if it is good then we can have more variety on this particularly for more uh, harsh climate range traits means it should be early variety early duration like less than 90 days because this is the only duration where you can grow the variety now coming to the win, win traits or game changers this is the main thing. If you are having a variety with the saponin free, that's a glycoside, it's a triterpenoid glycoside. If you can have a variety with less than 0.02% of the saponin, you can develop a saponin free variety and it's also called sweet variety. Because if you don't have the saponin, you reduce the processing cost and it will become more profitable to the farmers as well as the processors. So far, there is no variety in the public domain which is saponin free or sweet variety. There are varieties which are from the private sectors, but they need the money because there is, they just get the royalty about that. So this type of trade should be included in our breeding program. So if we talk about the breeding program throughout the world, it is still in the very primitive stage. When we say primitive stage, because the most of the varieties which are developed or being developed they're mostly from the introduction or mass selection or land raises or sometimes even single plant selection. And single plant selection means they are also going for the single seed descent method and selecting the plant for it. But there are only few labs which are working on the recombination building. In the recombination building, the major hurdle, major bottleneck is the floral structure. Because quinoa is having very small flora, and in this small flora, it is a usually, you know, this is a predominantly self-pollinated crop. So in case if it opens, the, this has two types of florets, hermaphrodite and female flower. If you remove, if you don't remove the hermaphrodite flower before it uh, enthesis, before the enthesis, it will automatically pollinate the female flower. So you have to do it very carefully right from the beginning. You have to do the emasculation. So this is the biggest bottleneck for the breeding in the quinoa, particularly the recombination building. But we are overcoming this process or like a recombination process through the different methods and we are just trying for that so what have we have done already so far we have already identified the donors because the first and foremost thing is that do you have the variability and if you have the variability do you have the donors so we also have the the inwa ikwa has identified the different donors for the trait of interest and trait of interest are earliness plant height saponin content the grain colors, etc. So we already have the trait of interest and the donors for the trait of interest. And now the second thing is that if we have to speed the, uh, our breeding efforts, we have to go for the marker assisted selection. And in the marker assisted selection, you need to have a marker and UTL 
like a close relationship. If you have the reliable or closely related markers for the specific cuticle, whether it's a saponin content or uh, height or maturity, you can try it right in the beginning. You can choose the plant for the making the crosses. So for that, we already have a association mapping panel or the diversity panel, and that panel has been tested at two locations and six more locations we are going to test it in the sub-saharan africa mena region central asia region south of south asia and southeast asia once we get had once we have this phenotypic data because phenotyping is the key nowadays if we have this robust phenotypic data we will have the definitely robust the qtl and marker association and we are also going to have desert life science center very soon in Iqbal, maybe in the, within a few weeks, we will have our own genome sequencer so we can speed up this our process and develop the high yielding sweet and early maturing quinoa variety within the region very quickly for the different uh, product profiles and for the different regions. So the key, home, key take home message is with my presentation is if we talk about the varieties for the marginal environment, particularly saline and dry environment, quinoa is the best crop and as it is very highly saline. And for the dry climate area, for, uh, and then tailor-made variety. If you make the tailor-made variety based on product profile, that leads to the better acceptability in the farmers as well as the like uh, consumers. And saponin-free varieties are the game changers if we can make it. And probably we will be doing it very soon. And mass supplemented bidding efforts. If we can do it quickly, then it can speed up our bidding and genetic improvement process in of quinoa at Ikba. So with this, thank you very much. And this is our center. If you have not seen this, ICBA, International Center for Biosolar and Agriculture, where we are working on very harsh climate. And that, that, that's why I can say the tagline of ICBA, Agriculture for Tomorrow, is very befitting because we are really working for the climate change scenario under the very harsh climate. Thank you very much. You can have the question and you can have my email in case if you can post moral questions in the later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rakesh, for this informative presentation on quinoa improvement for highly saline and dry climate. Some challenges that regarding uh, breeding for uh, improved varieties, uh, saponine free, uh, trying also uh, to overcome seed dormancy. Thank you again. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ndei Dakjob who is agricultural officer in the seed and plant genetic resource team of the plant production and protection division of FO in Rome. Ndei is responsible for the sustainable use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Prior to joining FAO, Ndei worked at CIMIT, where she supported the integration of efficiency enhancing biotechnologies and analytics into national crop improvement programs. She had also worked in advanced laboratory in the United States and France. Ndei holds a PhD in plant physiology. The floor is yours, Ndei. Over. Thank you so much, Remy. I would like to start uh, sharing my screen. Um, Okay, sorry, he's coming. I think now, yes, now it is done. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to um, today introduce um, uh, quinoa production uh, through FAO's work. And uh, this presentation I will be making today is a presentation on the behalf of the agricultural officers colleague from this region and sub-regional offices who in fact implemented all this project. The United Nations has declared 2013 as the International Year of, of Quinoa with the objective to increase awareness of quinoa as a strategic food and food security to promote its uh, production and consumption. FAO was then designated as a technical secretary for the International Year um, of Quinoa and was to implement the program globally with activities including promotional ones, research and crop intensification, among others. In, um, that is how in 2013, 
FAO has launched the global program to support country in the introduction of quinoa in their production system. There was at least 28 countries that has requested the support of uh, FAO. Most of them was from uh, the African continent, 18, and uh, there was also four from the Near East and uh, five from Asia. The duration of this uh, project was uh, very short. It was usually between one and two years. And uh, there was uh, about between two and, uh, and 14 varieties that was tested, you know, um, but mostly is, uh, the number of varieties in the country was around 10. The implementation plan of this project has included season long on the job training, training workshops, uh, field days on quinoa crop management and seed production. There was also a demonstration plot trial that was conducted as part of the strategy to showcase the performance and the use of quinoa. If the first idea to plant quinoa in, uh, was to, uh, the first idea was to plant quinoa during the rainy season, in some country, it appeared that quinoa was better suited to the dry season planting, therefore under irrigation. The, there was a certain number of capacity development activities that was carried out in uh, some of the country, and there was one international consultant impact that was involved. It, for the case of West Africa, unfortunately, we were, they were not able to benefit from um, the international consultant because it was during the Ebola epidemic, therefore um, the travel was banned. Some country in Asia, like Bhutan and Sri Lanka, was even able to get, uh, um, to get exchange visited with uh, Peru. That was the best way to be able to master the crop production and also the use of quinoa. Among the challenges, there was a major one which was to do with access to quality seed. It was not easy because uh, after uh, the International Year of uh, Quinoa, there was a ban on export of uh, quinoa uh, in Bolivia and in Peru. Therefore, seed was very much delayed to arrive into the country, and when they arrived, they failed to germinate. Therefore, in most cases, it was uh, necessary to have a plan B, uh, which means uh, trying to import seed from other sources like in Europe, in the US, in Chile, and also in Argentina. For, um, for a project that is of a duration of one to two years, of course, when you miss one planting season, that is very critical into the delivery of the project. The crop management techniques was also quite different from the ones that are from the known crop. Therefore, we had the seed here that are very small, and most of the time was planted manually. Uh, the plant, the seed also has a great need of soil moisture in order to, to germinate. And we, um, what they found out is like, it is the, the phase that is very critical, it is the first few weeks uh, for the establishment of the plant. Therefore, um, because of the lack of technical prof, um, proficiency of uh, the crop management, uh, there was a lot of failure in some of the countries into, in, uh, during this uh, introduction phase, but also even countries that was able to grow the crop, there was instability for, uh, from one year to, to the other. Uh, this slide is mainly to show how we have seen differences between uh, within one country into the, uh, the yield potential and also amongst the different countries. Therefore, it is very diverse. Uh, the development of uh, training material for farmers in local languages is very critical if you want them to be able to produce and, uh, and adopt the, the technology. But also, there will be uh, opportunity to develop quinoa mo mobile application giving farmers uh, the technical advice on uh, how to cultivate quinoa 
those also can be implement, uh, um, can also have uh, some uh, videos. As a way forward, uh, we, there was, um, following the first phase of uh, Kinoa introduction, a certain number of research institutions and universities in the countries that was involved has continued to work on the Kinoa in order to find best management practices. Uh, some country also was able to get access to a wide range of accession. For example, in Pakistan, they were able to get 500 accession and in Burkina Faso, 124. That is very much, that is very important for the research part. Three countries in West Africa have included quinoa into the registration crop list. That is very important if they would like to register quinoa, um, variety of quinoa, but also for quinoa to be included into their national seed laws. Uh, some variety has been released, at least in some countries, Bhutan, Pakistan, and, uh, and Burkina Faso, maybe in more. And also um, quinoa can be promoted as uh, uh, for crop rotation and diversification. But for that, it would be necessary to develop a communication plan. Uh, because of the lack of knowledge uh, it, that we have seen into the crop, it is very much important to create a space for exchange between the people that are um, experiencing quinoa. For that, there is a community of practice called GCN Quinoa that has been created to facilitate communication between producers, expert politicians, and also any person that is involved into quinoa. Uh, we have seen in Morocco, for example, they have created a WhatsApp group to share information and photos. And uh, while in Algeria, they created some Facebook pages that also include some, um, business, small businesses. All of this is important to be able to link the different people that are now getting into the quinoa production. And uh, some, most of the government was very keen, in fact, uh, into this introduction of quinoa. We have seen in some cases where a large scale demonstration plot has been put in place. There was also um, in some country where they went ahead and uh, start search, uh, looking, um, putting in place new projects for, for, for funding. But also uh, we have seen in some country where promotion of the quinoa activities has got the involvement of the president and the first lady. All of this to say how much of, of traction quinoa has brought. Therefore, just to conclude, um, today in 2020, FAO is initiating a new collaboration with uh, CIRAD, ICBA, uh, CAS, uh, the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science, in a new program to relaunch the production of quinoa to achieve the SDGs. The program objective is to increase agricultural productivity of farmers in marginal land by enabling them to include quinoa into their crop production. With that, thank you for your attention. To, over to you, Remy. Thank you, Ndei. Thank you for sharing this highlight on the International Year of Quinoa and on various initiatives that aim at the promoting uh, the production and then the consumption of quinoa in various countries. Uh, distinguished participants, uh, now we are going to enter the, the Q&A sessions. We have received quite a number of questions. I'll start with the first one, which the first question comes from Mozambique and then is addressed to all participants. How could we uh, access the publication about quinoa? This is a new crop from Mozambique, from Mozambique but it's already in the local market. Uh, over uh, to any of you, the panelists, who would like to start. Over to you. Yes, uh, Dr. Elwafi, please. Over uh, to you. Call me Ismahan Remy, please. Okay. So, yes. So for Mozambique, we have a project uh, with IFAD that we started last year in seven countries in Africa, and Mozambique is one of them. And we are planning to, there is trials of quinoa that's gonna happen in Mozambique and their IFAD called Rizadi project. But I'm sure for publications, there are many of them on our website, the one that are related to ICBA, 
And I'm sure the same thing for, for the other colleagues from CIRAD and FL. But it will be very interesting to look how Kinoa uh, uh, behave under uh, the different environments in Mozambique and the Rezadi project. And RK is very much involved in that project. Thank you, Isman. Uh, any can, additional input? Yes, Didier. Thank you, Remy. I can complete the information from Ms. Mann. Uh, you can find many interesting information in the state of your report published by FAO and CIRAD in uh, 2014 in Spanish and 2015 in English. And uh, with all the TCP projects developed by FAO after the International Year of Kino, we are preparing a, a working paper with countries from Eastern and Southern Africa, Uganda, Malawi, Kenya, and it will be launched in a few weeks. So it will be very interesting for you to access to this document and all FAO documents are in open access. Okay, thank you, Didier. Day, do you want to add anything regarding publications? No, um, nothing at this point. Yes, Rakesh, over to you. I just compliment what uh, Dr. Sman mentioned. It's already available on our website. ICBA has a policy of like open access policy. So most of the publications are there. But in case if you have the difficulty to access the site, you can send an email to us and we can just very happy to provide those publications. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second uh, question comes from Dr. Azam Kayase from uh, Dubai, and then he would like to know how to collaborate with IGBA. Uh, Rakesh? <laughs> so actually, Dr. Kayase, we are working with, with Dr. Kayase, we are working on what's the impact of using saline water, particularly seawater, on, on the guts, on human guts and biocom. So he's a specialist in biocom. I think he's just started working with Dr. Sisi on saliconia because saliconia is irrigated with seawater or with brine water from Bisal. But absolutely, Dr. Kayase, maybe we should look at quinoa as well. We have been discussing only a very high salinity impact on the biocom, but maybe we should expand it to crops that are very nutritious, uh, like quinoa and, and others, maybe millet and others. Rakesh, you want to add uh, anything? No, I think uh, that Usman is already saying that that's the final word, no problem. We are from the same, same institute, and actually, and uh, once he said that, and she's already in touch with those guys. The next question is for Didier. In your opinion, if the quinoa is already in 125 countries around the world and with the all advantages it has, what are the challenges of spreading it as major crop as wheat and barley? Over to you, Didier. Thank you, Remy, for the question. I think there are some elements about that during the introduction uh, given by Isman about uh, major crops and minor crops, because all the research is given to major crops. So we have very few funds for studying uh, neglected and unterrorized species. And it is very important to coordinate our efforts if we want to develop quinoa now. And another point is that uh, for major crops, there are many problems of their selection during the last 50 years. And one important thing is not to have more quinoa, but it is important to conserve and to maintain the high quality of quinoa for food system and for nutrition. And we need to think uh, how can we select and create new varieties, maintaining the different uses and the different nutritional quality of quinoa, because it is the end, quinoa for nutrition. 
and for good nutrition. And if we have a look to wheat, for example, during the last 50 years, wheat lost more than half of its proteins. And we don't want that for quinoa. It's just an example for passing from minor crop to major crop. And we need to think about, about that. How, can we, how do we want to use quinoa in cropping system and in food system? Thank you. Thank you, Didier. Uh, the next question is about the problem of salinity. And uh, one participant is asking why is the yield of quinoa so low in Morocco? I think Isman can tell because she has a <laughs> huge yes. on so, <laughs> Actually, in part two, Remy, we will have uh, one presentation. I was just discussing with Jean Boroto. We will have a presentation of the value chain in Morocco. Uh, it's a project that we have been running for four years now with uh, IDRC Canada and UM University Mohammed VI of Polytechnic. So in Morocco, the, the, the productivity uh, that we are looking at, it's anywhere between one ton to four ton per hectare. So in my mind, it's not low. So the one ton was in a non-irrigated land in the region of Yusufia. And the highest productivity that we got was about 3.9 ton per hectare, but it was in irrigated in Layoun in South Morocco. So uh, I, I don't think it's very low. And maybe, uh, maybe better to hold on this question to part two, because, uh, because uh, Dr. Aziz Herish from UM6P would be presenting the, the project outcomes after four years of developing the value chain in Morocco. So maybe he has more data, but as far as I know, it's not very low. It's, uh, it's quite high, particularly under irrigated and, uh, and uh, improved, uh, improved uh, genotypes. Thank you, thank you. Then we'll pick, uh, I think, the last question. There are more and more questions, but I would like to ensure, uh, to reassure participants that all these questions will be compiled and will be addressed in due time. But since we are running short of time, I'll pick uh, one last question. And uh, uh, it's about what is the best way to treat quinoa to remove saponine without reaching its nutritional value? I think the, there is a machine, like a sheller machine, you can remove that and a little bit uh, on the, like uh, you have to wash the saponin and with the little bit machine, that's a specification. And from that specification, you can just do with the rubber rollers and then washing, then there is no like a removal of any nutrients on that. So you can just save that. And the best way, you know, which I told, saponin free variety in case you get the saponin free variety there will be no processing on that one so that is the another way which we are working on that okay thank you rakesh so uh, as i indicated earlier uh, all questions the question which are not being addressed during uh, this q and a session uh, will be uh, compiled and then uh, the answers will be sent to uh, to the participants now, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Tanya Santibanes for uh, the closing remarks. Tanya is an agricultural officer for Europe and Central Asia and delivery manager of regional initiative, natural resource management, and in a changing climate at FAO. Tanya holds a master's degree in organic chemistry and postgraduate degrees on environmental management systems, ecotoxicology and environmental defenders organization, and social economy and fair trade. Tanya has been working at FAO for 20 years, and her key area of expertise is sustainable and agri-food system. Tanya was the global coordinator for the International Year of Quinoa in 2013. Tanya, the floor is yours. It's Thank you, Remy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, our colleagues in Latin America. 
As uh, Ismad uh, already mentioned, COVID-19 has generated health and economic crisis across the globe. And we know that its impact on poverty rates and food security will be high. According to some estimates, the pandemic will cause global poverty to increase by 548 million, along with the number of food insecurity people estimated to be 183 million. This new threat will add another level of pressure to the ongoing livelihood of drought, floods and climate change. Nowadays, we are facing three big global challenges, health, economic and climate change. In this context, quinoa could play an important role in tackling poverty and food insecurity. It's a crop food with enormous nutritional and cultural value, along with the great capacity to adapt to the most adverse agroclimatic condition. Quinoa generates knowledge. Quinoa generates local development and energize economies. Scientific evidence confirms that quinoa tolerates very dry conditions, including drought. It uses water very effectively. Quinoa also withstands extreme temperatures from minus 8 degrees Celsius to 38. It's able to endure extreme solar radiation and along with other positive attributes, quinoa is a viable alternative crop for food insecure countries in the context of natural disaster and climate change. It has high socioeconomic potential and exists two different challenges, like to access to quinoa germoplasm and lack of human and economic resources to promote quinoa, to mention just some of them. In 2013, with the slogan, future some thousand years ago, we had the opportunity and the privilege of contribute to and celebrate the International Year of Quinoa. Now, seven years later, thanks to the commitment of the governments, international organizations, NGOs, producers, academia, and the private sector, that International Quinoa is nearing realized its fundamental objective of Quinoa becoming valued and recognized globally as a food that can help to reduce food insecurity. In 2013, in the framework of the International Year of Quinoa, definitely it was a trip from the Andean to the world. It was an encounter between the past and the future, between the ancestral knowledge and scientific knowledge. In sum, now we have more knowledge on Quinoa, more production, more consumption, and it has been created a work agenda in the different countries with a series of challenge and opportunities. And now, in 2020, in the COVID-19 scenario, the collaboration and cooperation among all the stakeholders, the search, international organization, private sector, farmers, NGO, will be crucial. In this scenario, it requires more investment in research and the capacity building in different areas. From the adaptability of quinoa outside of the Andean area in inclusive quinoa value chain, we need to work in quinoa value chain, but this should be inclusive quinoa value chain. We need to invest in nutrition and consumption in order to promote quinoa as an essential contributor to national agenda for food and nutrition security, especially in more vulnerable countries. And I would like to conclude with Helen Keller's thoughts. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, before we close this session, you are all invited to the next WAZA webinar, which will take place on 23rd June 2020 from 3 to 4 p.m. Central European time. The title of this webinar is Water and Nutrition from Research to Action. WASAC support team is sharing uh, the, the screen with you so you have uh, all the details. You can save the date and then the time. So uh, please let me seize again this opportunity uh, to thank once more all speakers. 
Ismahan, Didier, Rakesh, Ndei, and Tanya. Thank you very much. And uh, thank also to all participants for joining. And then uh, we look forward to being with you again for the part two of this uh, uh, Kinoa webinar. Thank you again. Bye-bye.